Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist and today I wanted to talk to you about a subject um, <clears throat> which a lot of people have written to me about and this is a, about a condition called mitral regurgitation. Um, a lot of people these days, particularly people who listen to my um, videos, have had echocardiograms and uh, they've been told, oh, you've got nothing, it's nothing major, but you've got a little bit of mitral regurgitation. And for a lot of people, that causes them a great deal of concern. So I thought I'd do a video on this subject, mitral regurgitation, uh, just so that you understand uh, what it is, or what are the consequences of it, uh, when is it serious, when is it not serious, and when not to worry about it. So let me just talk you through mitral regurgitation okay now what is mitral regurgitation mitral regurgitation is when one of the valves known as the mitral valve okay uh, becomes leaky so what is the mitral valve it's a valve here uh, between the left atrium and the left ventricle so this is your valve here okay why do we have this valve because the heart gets blood come in you know, oxygen-rich blood. So blood goes to the lungs. From the lungs, it comes to the heart. It comes into the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve, and then goes into the left ventricle, and then it gets pumped out. Now, if we didn't have this valve, when the left ventricle is pumping or is contracting, blood would go back into the lungs, and that would cause congestion in the lungs because there would be too much blood in the lungs. And the blood would seep out into the lungs and we would get breathless. So we've been given this valve, which basically opens to allow uh, blood to go into the ventricle. But then when the ventricle is contracting to pump blood out through this valve to the rest of the body, this valve closes to prevent blood leaking back, to prevent blood going back into the lungs. All right. So that's what the mitral valve does. Now, the mitral valve can get leaky and if it gets leaky uh, then in its severest state it can cause problems let me talk you through what happens if the mitral valve becomes very leaky and i'm only really referring to if it becomes very leaky the what happens okay so the left ventricle will contract okay instead of all the blood going in through this valve into the aorta to the rest of the body some blood will leak back into the left atrium okay now what happens then that means that instead of all the blood going out of the heart some blood is going back and therefore the kidneys which are very sensitive to this will get less blood than they expect now the natural response of the kidneys is if they get less blood they try and absorb more volume from the urine to try and restore the circulating volume. So the kidneys think, oh, the reason we're getting less is because this person is dehydrated. And therefore, they absorb more water from the urine. And that water, you know, um, serves to restore the circulating volume. So now what happens is, let's say you've got, um, you're expecting... 100 to go out here, 100 mils, but instead 20 leaks back, and so you get only 80 mils going. So the kidneys will think, oh, we were expecting 100 mils, we've only gotten 80 mils, that means we need to absorb and try and restore um, the 100 mils. So they'll try and, this is a very simplistic thing, but they'll try and get that 20 mils. So now what happens is you've got uh, the kidneys absorbed another 20 mils, so you've got 100 mils coming back, but you've already got another 20 mils here. And therefore, next thing you find is you've got 120 mils coming into the left ventricle. Now, at this point, what happens is 120 mils have gone in, but instead of 120 mils going out, remember, 20% leaks back. Okay, so 20% of 120 mils will leak back, which means, again, the kidneys will get less and the kidneys will start absorbing more and you get into this vicious cycle but the net result is 
that there's a lot more volume coming into the heart. Okay, it's a condition of volume overload because the volume keeps going up because the kidneys get into the state where they keep absorbing um, uh, water from the urine. And so you're getting more and more volume. And what happens then is eventually the left ventricle, this chamber, starts getting more and more volume. It starts getting stretched and it starts stretching. Now, the problem is that although some stretch is okay because the left ventricle will then beat more effectively, at some point you stretch it so much that you lose the elasticity of the left ventricle. In that sense, it's like a bit like a rubber band. You know, you take a rubber band, you stretch it, the rubber band twangs back together. You stretch it further, it twangs back harder. But at a certain point, if you stretch it too much, it loses its elasticity. And the left ventricle is like this. So if it continues and you get into this continuous vicious cycle, then the left ventricle get, will get bigger and bigger and it will lose its elasticity and it will become weaker and weaker. Unfortunately, when it gets to that stage, you can't restore the strength. So even if you do something to the valve at that point, you cannot, um, the left ventricle does not recover. So one of the big problems with this is the weakening of the left ventricle with time. And when people look at the valve and they're assessing it, one of the important determinants of whether the valve needs fixing is if there's any suggestion that the left ventricle is getting weaker. Now, for the majority of people, okay, when you've got more volume here, okay, before it starts weakening, because it's like a rubber band, you're pulling it, it'll twang back harder. So the ejection fraction actually goes up with mitral regurgitation until that point. And so if you've got significant mitral regurgitation, you actually expect the left ventricular function to be better than normal because you're stretching it, okay? But, and you're expecting it to twang back. When the left ventricle starts becoming what you would normally expect to see in a normal person without mitral regurgitation, uh, at that point, you're actually un you actually start thinking that actually maybe the left ventricle is now beginning to get weaker because, um, say, uh, the ejection fraction is, is, say, 60% in a normal person. In severe mitral regurgitation, you would expect it to be much more, 70%, 80%. And actually, when you find that the ejection fraction in mitral regurgitation, significant mitral regurgitation is 60%, something that you would expect in a normal person, you actually worry that now the left ventricle is beginning to weaken. Okay, And that's one of the important things just to bear in mind, that, um, that uh, these patients, because they have more volume, they actually have more twang you know you're you're stretching the left ventricle and therefore the left ventricle is coming together but at some point when you've pushed it too much when there's too much or the left ventricle the mitral regurgitation has become very severe then you lose the elasticity and actually the ejection fraction then starts dropping it'll become normal and then if things continue it will continue to drop then there is no way of actually improving the left ventricular function because you've lost that elasticity. So most people look at that and say, as soon as the left ventricle is beginning to, the left ventricular function is beginning to go down, you need to operate on the valve. Another thing just to bear in mind is that because what you're having is a lot more volume, uh, some of this volume can congest the lungs and the pressure in the lungs can go up. And therefore, one of the hallmarks of mitral regurgitation when it gets more severe is breathlessness brought on by physical exertion. So that's another uh, thing. However, the first thing to say is not all people who have mitral regurgitation will go on and have severe mitral regurgitation. And that's one of the important things to talk about. You have to think of mitral regurgitation. Um, there are three types of mitral regurgitation, okay? There is physiological mitral regurgitation. That is that, and 70% of the normal population have mild or trivial mitral regurgitation. And the reason they have that is because as you are, when you're a child, your thorax is uh, uh, much rounder, your chest is much rounder. As one grows up, the chest becomes flatter. And this affects the geometry of the mitral valve and therefore a small leak is possible. 
but this is of no consequence whatsoever, okay? Trivial mitral regurgitation, mild mitral regurgitation, if there is no abnormality of the mitral valve itself, is a completely normal phenomena and is not going to cause any major trouble. So if you're told you have trivial mitral regurgitation, all you need to say is, are my leaflets fine? If that's the case, then you don't need to worry. Nothing else needs to be done, all right? 70% of the normal population will have mild or trivial mitral regurgitation. However, you can also get mitral regurgitation for other reasons. You can have a predominant problem with the mitral valve, okay? Now, if you're unlucky enough to be born with one leaflet which is much longer than the other, or one leaflet which is in some way damaged, then, then you can get significant mitral regurgitation. And in those people, it is worth keeping an eye on the mitral regurgitation by echocardiography once every year. Another mechanism by which you can have it is degenerative change. So if you have, you know, if you're getting older, you can get development of calcium. Calcium can be deposited on the mitral valve, which can then affect how one leaflet closes um, compared to the other, and that can cause a gap and you can get this leakage. So those people who have degenerative uh, um, uh, disease of the mitral valve, I, the mitral valve is being affected with age-related changes, have a much higher risk of progressing to significant mitral regurgitation with time. Another thing that can happen sometimes, if you're very unlucky, um, is you can get an infection of the mitral valve. And if you get an infection of the leaflet, what can happen is one leaflet can either um, rupture or even these points which are holding these leaflets because you get tiny strands to the left ventricle, those can rupture. And that happens then the patient is much more likely to get severe mitral regurgitation and they require an operation to treat it. So that's the, uh, that's the, um, that's a pro those things are about a problem with the mitral valve itself. But remember, the mitral valve is attached to the left ventricle. And if you have a patient who has significant left ventricular uh, uh, dilatation, i.e. the left ventricle is in some way damaged or one part doesn't move as well as the other, then that will alter the geometry because the mitral valve is attached to the left ventricle. So if one part, for example, if you've had a heart attack over here, you know, then this part of the heart muscle will not move, but the other parts will, and therefore the geometry of the mitral valve, which is attached to both sides, will get affected, and this will cause significant leaking. So um, that's called, that's more due to the left ventricle. Another thing just to be aware of is say people who have high blood pressure, for example, if you have very high blood pressure, then the heart has to beat much harder. It has to generate a lot more force to get blood out. And therefore it is more likely that you will get some leakage back as well if you already have mitral regurgitation. So in essence, the first thing to be aware is that if you're told you have mitral regurgitation, uh, what you want to ask your doctor is, is it physiological mitral regurgitation? I, is it very mild? Is it trivial? And are my valve leaflets okay? And is my left ventricle okay? If those are fine, forget about the mitral regurgitation. It's not going to bother you. If you do have, if he says, well, look, you know, um, my, my, your, your valve looks like it's calcified. These are age-related changes. It looks degenerative. Then what you will need is for someone to keep an eye on the valve to make sure it's not getting you know, more leaky, but more importantly, to make sure that the left ventricular function remains hyperdynamic. Because if it starts becoming normal, then you worry that the mitral regurgitation is getting worse and the heart is losing its elasticity. Um, <clears throat> finally, it's always very useful for you to be aware of symptoms the big symptom is breathlessness or exertion. Uh, and if you are finding that you're getting more breathless as time progresses um, and you have severe mitral regurgitation, then that probably need, that does need operative correction. Um, so two reasons for operative correction. One, if you're getting breathless and your exercise capacity gets less. Two, if there's any suggestion that the left ventricle is beginning to lose its elasticity. Okay. Um, in general, uh, there are two types of operations that can be done for the mitral valve, uh, which are 
commonly used. Um, although some places they are beginning to do things through keyhole, but I'm not going to talk about that. Through an operation, you can have a mitral valve repair, uh, which is where they actually repair the valve but leave the valve intact. Uh, or you can have a mitral valve replacement where they actually take the valve out and put a new valve in. And that depends on the surgeon and what the pathology is causing the leaking of the valve. Uh, however, it is true to say that wherever possible, it is better to not have to replace the valve, if at all possible. It is better for you, for you to have your native valve and for a repair to be performed rather than a replacement. In fact, the operation risk of a repair is much less than a replacement. The um, uh, prognosis from a repair is generally better than a replacement. Having said that, both a repair and replacement will offer a significantly better prognosis in people who have severe mitral regurgitation, who are getting breathless and don't have to correct it. So I hope that was useful. Uh, um, and to all those people who've written to me and said, well, look, you know, it says triple MR, please don't worry about it. 70% of the population have it. Okay, so thank you so much for listening. Um, I'd be really grateful if you'd consider sharing this video if you found it useful. I love your comments, so you know I'm, I'm very grateful for all the kindness that you've shown me. I can't say it enough. Um, it's quite late, so I'm going to finish off soon. This is my Facebook page. This is my website. Uh, we have a telephone number. This is our telephone number. Um, and um, and um, yeah, thank you so much for listening. All the best. Take care.